if you believe in the ongoing prevailing narrative about an energy transition uh, from fossil fuels and nuclear to wind and solar, then you need to understand we're going to have to multiply mining, right. which they tend to not like, right. by about you know, a thousand percent tenfold. Right. So the mining capability to do what is being preached at Davos does not exist right now, right? It, like it, it, it doesn't exist. We're mandating things right. that don't exist. And so that alone, that's just one really amazing fact that you try to get across to people. If the people at Davos and in <laughs> D.C. could even understand that much, how much would the conversation change right away? Right. We'd have to start having realistic conversations about what to do next. So if you were advising, if they invited Mark Mills to Davos huh. <laughs> uh, and said, Mark. They'd have to pay me a lot to show up. No, go ahead. <laughs> well, as well they should. He was very expensive for me. Um, so as well they should. Um, you know, so if we can get every high school student, college student, Davos member to hear what you have to say, um, you could wave the wand. Yeah. What would you do right now on energy and environment policy? What would the, the, the Mills administration huh. look like? So let's, let, let me, let me reinforce something that you said. So uh, another factoid that's important is that we spent trillions. We got a few percent of our energy from wind and solar, uh, and I would say we wind and solar will become significant in some sense, not politically or politically significant now. It consume huge sums of money as a distraction to the world's economies. Uh, but wood, burning wood is a calibration point. Wood, oldest energy source known to man other than the muscles of animals. Wood supplies three times more energy to the world right now than wind and solar combined. So we, wind and solar haven't beaten wood yet. So there's no energy transition going on. But the attempt to make a transition by using windmills and solar plants and uh, batteries for electric cars, to your point, is extremely minerals intensive. So, uh, well, in a simple math terms, to deliver the same hour of heat, the same hour of computer time, the same uh, amount of materials to society, same amount of food with the so-called renewable path, wind, solar, batteries. You have to increase the number amount of minerals that you mine in the world from 400% to 7,000% and even 10,000%, you know, the hundredfold of what we do today to build the machines. These machines are built from copper, and aluminum, manganese, nickel, cobalt. So all these minerals, we need them to build those machines. They're not built largely out of steel, the way cars are, and conventional power plants. So the world has enough mineral. I'm not a Malthusian. The crust of the earth has more than enough minerals. That's not the issue. We have more than enough energy in the universe. That's not the issue. The issue is building the machines to get what you need. When it comes to mining, you have to open a mine. If you have to dig for copper. So it's very easy to use Dr. Google to look up how much copper does the world produce, how many mines, what does it cost? This is very public data. How much copper will the world need? to reach the visions of the Davos crowd. And roughly, you have to double world copper production. All right, so what, right? What you'd want to know is how long does it take to open a copper mine? Because we're going to need hundreds of new big mines. Well, according to the International Energy Agency, and so they're a quasi-honest broker on this, <laughs> 10 to 20 years, average 10 to 12 years to open a new mine. And billions and billions of dollars. All right, so is anybody opening new mines? By and large, no. So this is where the, the sort of the roadblock or the, 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 the absence of a bridge to the, the green future is abundantly clear. We need, you have to have this incredible increase in mining of critical minerals. I don't mean rare earth elements, which get talked a lot about. Rare earth elements aren't rare. They have rare properties. That's why they're called that. They're common, but it's very difficult to build the mines. It takes billions and years. So if the world's not doing that and the world's mining industry is not investing in that level of expansion that fast, then you know the materials will not be available. So what would happen? If there's not going to be enough copper, stick with copper because you can't do anything in electricity without copper. If the world's short copper, what happens? Well, 
the markets will bid CARPA prices up for the people who want it the most will pay what they have to. So the construction industry buildings need copper. You can't build buildings without copper in the wiring systems. Is copper a big share of a building's cost? Not really. So could they bid it up a lot? Sure. In fact, the CEO of Ivanhoe Mines recently said that the bidding wars based on the demands for copper that are being created by the energy transition plans, the bidding wars could cause a tenfold increase in copper prices. I was like, wow, would that affect building prices? Not a lot. You know, it might add a few percentage costs to the building, but would it affect an electric vehicle price? If copper, just copper, forget lithium, forget the other elements, if just the copper went up tenfold, you'd add $15,000 to the cost of one EV. So what will happen? The EVs won't get built. The buildings will get built because you can't open the mines up fast enough, which is why I've said over and over again that there is not going to be an energy transition. doesn't mean we'll never mine enough copper. It just means no one's going to mine enough copper in the time frames that mat matter to try to achieve these goals. But if you spend a lot of money trying, we can cause a lot of economic destruction. We can cause a lot of social harm and destruction because the spending is the inverse of productive. It squanders money and also, and as you know, I've written about this, increases geopolitical risks. I hate to use the word exponentially because it's overused, but this is a case where it's accurate. We, we don't let mining happen in America anymore. This administration has actually reversed uh, mining permits from several existing mines that seek to expand at the same time as putting policies in place that increase the need for minerals that are mined. So who's the dominant supplier of refined minerals needed for the energy transition? We both know the answer to that question. It's the C word, it's China. China has a 50 to 80% market share in all the critical minerals. Their market share in critical minerals for the energy transition is double OPEC's market share in oil. To believe that they will never exercise any kind of market power, pricing power, or geopolitical influence because of that, you'd have to be incredibly naive to think that'll never happen. Has it really happened yet? They did send a warning shot across the bow when the Biden administration ratcheted down, ratcheted down restrictions on export of high-end computer chips to China on the basis that they might use them for Ill, nefarious purposes for the military, dual use, right? That was the basis. China announced that they were gonna consider restricting the exports of graphite because graphite could be a dual use material. So, well, graphite, who cares? All lithium batteries use graphite. All, not some. China is 90% of the world's graphite. And yes, you could use lithium batteries in a tank and in a, and in a Tesla. So it's dual use. They also announced that they were going to consider restricting the export of gallium, a rare element in the periodic table. People, who cares? Well, gallium arsenide is a semiconductor compound that's how you make all kinds of microelectronic products like lasers light emitting diodes, computer screens, computer products, military products. And they said that could also be dual use. So we, China, might restrict exports of gallium. They produce 98% of the world's refined gallium. So this is a really, really risky, risky path that we're taking to increase our dependency on these kinds of minerals. So it, it puts uh, another country that might be hostile to us into the driver's seat in terms of making decisions bowing to what they want, yeah. and they make a lot of money. Reminds me a lot of the 70s <laughs> and OPEC and oil.